Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Michael Hoffman. Michael is doing a, a lecture, an amazing lecture on our upcoming neurology module and for the Nutrition Network. Um, and he's got an incredible CV, which I can't, it's actually quite long, so I'm not going to read it all. But he basically started his career and his he studied at the University of Witwatersrand um, in South Africa and followed by, carried on and did two senior doctorates, one in cerebro, cerebrovascular medicine and one in behavioral health as a PhD. Um, his main areas of research are around cognitive disorder, disorders after stroke and how to improve your brain based on scientific principles and evolutionary insights. Currently a professor of neurology with the University of Central Florida, chief of neurology at Orlando VA Medical Center and director of the stroke and cognitive neurology programs. Also a cognitive neurology consultant at Roskamp Neuroscience Institute in Florida, focusing on frontotemporal disorders, traumatic brain illness, neurotoxological syndrome, such as golf or illness. And you've written four books. So an incredible, incredible wealth of knowledge. Thank you so much for, for what you offer and the, the insight that you bring to our, many of our lectures at the Nutrition Network. Anything to add to that? What are you up to at the moment? Well, I'm, I'm very, very pleased to be part of the International Nutrition Network. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. this is a first internationally, and mm -hmm. I cannot stress how important this is because every, every single day I see people with loads of medication. I'm talking about one or two dozen, and I know that none of them are necessary in most of these people if they would only just eat the right foods. And you know, uh, all our major diseases, and even more so, I think, than just the major diseases, are a cause of poor nutrition. And so, this mm -hmm. is absolutely critical and um, and urgent that we fix this. So are you talking about your actual patients from a neurological perspective that are on medication, neurological and psychiatric medications Correct. or across Correct. the board? Mm. Across the board, you know, whether I deal with stroke, which is something I've done for many decades, whether it's uh, dementia, mild cognitive impairment, Parkinson's disease, migraine, mm. uh, I've, uh, pardon the expression, I used to say migraine, but in mm. the USA, if they, <laughs> migraine, they say, what's that? <laughs> uh, I meant to say migraine. <laughs> anyway, migraine, um, neuropathies, every mm. neurological disease you can trace back to poor nutrition at the end of the day. Mm, sure. And of course, psychiatric disorders similarly. Okay, so, so that's quite a bold statement. Yes. And does the rest of your profession agree with you? I mean, is that the consensus? More and more. I mean, mm. I still run into mm. cardiologists that uh, prescribe a lot of statins and say mm. high cholesterol causes heart disease, but it's rapidly changing now. Mm. You know, you see mm. some of the latest US guidelines and cardiology journals, they now get the point about that high carbohydrates are causing the problem and, and not high fat diets. But you know, it's a process mm. that's going to take many, many years, but it, I see it is having its effects already. Mm. There's a, there's a, gr a groundswell of activity in, in the right direction. So talk about what, you know, how you would approach that with a patient. So if you, a patient comes to you and it's obvious to you that they're on medications that could be treated differently or there could be a different approach, how do you address it? Yeah, you know, they, I'm aware of these difficulties because I, I know that they could leave my office and go next door to see one of the other doctors, whether it's uh, a GP, primary care, cardiology, and they may get a completely different story. Mm -hmm. And I have to deal with that. And I, I, I think that the best way to deal with that is a personal discussion with a physician, because mm -hmm. I've had the completely opposing view of what I tell a patient and what another specialist tells a patient. And the best mm -hmm. way is not by text or phone or email. It's just say hi one day. Go see them and say mm -hmm. And many, many people, um, one of my recent colleagues, he was the chief of endocrinology, and he was on statins. And I told him, you know, are you aware of this whole business about statins and cholesterol not having anything to do with heart disease? He said, no. I said, just read this book, The Big Fat Surprise. <laughs> Mm. He did, and it changed his life. Mm. Mm. And he's now mm. happy to retire at the age of 55, which is way too young to retire, by the way. Mm. Mm. <laughs> um, because we're only peaking our 70s, did you know that? Mm. Uh, well, maybe if you follow your guidelines and recommendations, <laughs> that's certainly not what we see in the population, you know, and that's, 
Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the interpersonal discussions with other physicians are very, very important in this whole game because mm. as Tim Noakes has pointed out, you, you're going to have people still believing in the old dictum that we all grew up with 30, mm. 40 years ago. And mm. Some people are just too busy to read all these books and you have mm. to read the books more so than the journals of course because the journals are all influenced by by other people like pharmaceutical mm. companies and your nutrition uh, folk and so forth so mm -hmm. yeah but um, i'm very pleased that things are changing so so can you just explain to me and to sort of i'm not going to say the lay person because we have a lot of practitioners medical practitioners that are our audience but what are you in your perspective what is the cause of cognitive and neurological decline how does it happen what is it what are the drivers well it's aging of the brain all mm. right now the brain does not have to necessarily age until it gets to 90 or 100 mm. but what is people have aging brains already in their 40s and 50s that's way too mm. young mm. and if your if your vascular system which is basically supplying energy to the brain is deficient then your mm. brain cannot function and what what mm. makes your vascular supply deficient clogging of the arteries and inflammation mm. and that can all be basically linked to to predominantly poor nutrition mm. and and to a degree lack of exercise. You know, exercise is important not to lose weight, but to decrease inflammation in the human body. Mm -hmm. And I touch on this in my, in my talk that um, we are different from the great apes like the chimpanzees. They don't have to exercise like we do. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. They kind of laze around and have a good life in the forest. Mm -hmm. Whereas we are programmed, we are designed to do quite a lot of exercise to decrease the inflammation in our body, which, mm -hmm. which served us very well to fight infection in our evolutionary past. So, okay. So, so what kind of exercise are we talking about here? For, you know, I mean, what levels? Just, just about okay. anything will do. You know, you can just do 15 minutes. It's beneficial per day. But, but you, I, I mean, in your talk, you're talking, you talk quite a bit about quite, quite intense levels of exercise as being optimal. Is that your position? Is that correct for you? Well, not, not, not intense, but kind of moderate. Mm -hmm. um, for mm -hmm. example, um, I offer people a, a smorgasbord of activities. Like I ask them, first of all, what, what kind of things do you like doing? Mm -hmm. If somebody loves playing tennis, I'm not going to make them run if they, or suggest mm -hmm. they run if they hate running. Mm -hmm. I've had a lot of people, uh, especially in Florida, turn to kayaking because, you know, their joints are bad and they, they don't like running or walking and they love the water. And we have lots of water everywhere. So mm -hmm. a lot of people mm -hmm. have had their lives turned around and they're happily kayaking one or two hours a day, which is roughly the intensity of a slow jog. Mm -hmm. But I do advocate something like half an hour, five, six times a week. Mm, and mm. I, I quite like using that um, Norwegian Institute of Science and Technology fitness age calculation, which is on the web. Anybody can access it. And you plug in your data and it, it, instead of giving you your chronological age, it gives you a fitness age. That's very and so if you're very fit, mm. it can lower your, your age by 15 to 20 years. And if you're very, very unhealthy, it can increase your age by 20 to 25 years. Mm. And also with the implication that you will not live as long. Mm. Mm. So it's very powerful and it's, it's very much, it's highly regarded, published in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings. So I use that with some people, not everybody, because not everybody's gonna take well to this. Mm. People who need to be scared a little bit into believing that they need to change their lifestyle, it works wonders. Imagine if I told somebody who is 35 that they're actually 70. Mm. They would freak mm. out. Not so. Yeah, I mean, and particularly I'm thinking of with COVID and the sort of association with age being a factor. I mean, somebody that's 45 might well present as a sort of 68-year-old and right. that suddenly puts them, they're feeling confident and, you know, able to take it on and then suddenly it puts them in the high-risk category. Yeah. So very interesting. What, so that's the next question I wanted to actually ask you is what are your thoughts? I, know, I think it was yesterday or this week a study came out that said that one third of people with COVID have had post-COVID neurological complications and mental health, psychiatric complications of some kind. 
Yes. What are your thoughts on how COVID's impacting mental health and psychiatric health in general? Yeah, you know, COVID is is a is a uh, disease process that um, increases inflammation in the body, and that's mm. exactly what a poor diet does as well. It increases inflammation in the entire body, especially in the vascular system and the brain. COVID does a similar mm. thing. That's why the two are kind of synergistic. But if you already mm. have a high inflammatory index in your body, which can easily be calculated, you're at high risk of COVID and, and you're also at high risk of dying from COVID or having mm. serious complications. And I've had quite a few COVID patients in the ICU who, young people, 28, 30s, early 30s, they come in one day with some symptoms, the next day they're dead, just mm. like that. Mm. It can be quite a scary business. Um, and it, it all goes to show that we really have to look after our, our bodies. Mm. You cannot have a healthy mind in an unhealthy body. It just doesn't work like that. Because the two mm. are very closely linked and we share the vascular system. So mm. you want to have a healthy cardiovascular system so you can get your energy and blood supply and oxygen to your brain. Otherwise, it cannot work properly. And what interests me, and I think it's in my first or second slide, <clears throat> pardon me, are the subclinical variants. In mm. other words, it, it can be quite obvious if somebody has severe depression or bipolar disease or stroke. Mm. But what happens about those gray, gray areas where somebody has, his thinking is not rational or mm. you fly off the mm. handle or you're irritable? Mm. And you do and say things that you would otherwise not do. And, you know, the, the frontal cortex, which is the executive part of our brain, is the most capricious or sensitive part of the brain. So even if you don't sleep properly, you have a bad night's sleep. You, you're a terrible person the next day, aren't you? Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you, you, can, you can say things to people you regret. You may even do things mm -hmm. you regret. You may mm -hmm. send off that email which you would then regret at a later date. Mm, mm. And some people, of course, uh, I, you know, I wonder about these rage attacks and the shootings. I wonder how much of that is actually due to just plain poor nutrition and an unhealthy body and mind. So what is your experience? I know obviously you grew up in South Africa and you lived here for a portion of your life. Is that correct? Correct. And you've lived in the United States. What is your experience of the differences in the populations health-wise and nutrition wise? Um, it's worse, it's worse in the US. Uh, I remember when I first came to Canada in the 19, 1989. That was just the time when the when the nutritional guidelines and the high, uh, high fructose corn syrup mm -hmm. business really took effect. And um, <clears throat> I've never been overweight. But mm. within the months of being in Canada, some people said, you know what? She picked up a bit of weight. <laughs> and I didn't mm. eat anything different. It was mm. just mm -hmm. whatever food you had there was just loaded with, with the, the carbohydrates, of course. And uh, I, I just noticed it was very interesting. And I, I, could, I can actually show you on my hospital identification cards what I looked like in Durban. I would mm. look like in Canada six months later. It was quite amazing. Sure, that's, that's incredible. So within six months, you you went from actually what's kind of a third world country to a first world country and your health deteriorated on the same diet, is what you're saying. Same diet, yeah. Sure. I would need that's, anything different. Sure. So that, that really opened my eyes to that there's something going on here. Mm, mm, absolutely. Um, but I think nowadays the the uh, you know the Ansel Keys diet that was invented some decades ago has taken effect pretty much worldwide, and and mm. most countries have a similar obesity problem at this stage. I think South mm. Africa mm. and the US are roughly on a par. Mm. Uh, within mm. the US, there are certain states that are super healthy, mm. like California, Colorado. Um, mm. Massachusetts, yeah. you know, you find people are much, much healthier, whereas the, the southern states are the opposite. So you talk about in your lecture on the Nutrition Network course that you're giving a lecture on at the moment, you talk about the connection between the microbiome and brain health. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, if you eat unhealthy foods, you're going to have 
unhealthy tenants in your in your gut. Mm. Now we mm. we all have one trillion cells in our body. Okay, we have a hundred billion neurons, but we have one trillion cells. That's it. Mm. But here's the here's the important part. We have twenty trillion microbes in our gut. So our mm. microbes outnumber us twenty to one. Mm. So we have to we have to really be very very careful how we treat our tenants. Because not only do they supply us with important neurotransmitters, you know, um, 90% of the serotonin and 50% of the dopamine, probably our two most important brain neurotransmitters, are formed in the gut due to mm. bacterial processes. Mm. And if you alter that balance of bacteria, then you will have immediate effects on brain function. So do you actually discuss this with patients and, and what do you recommend? What are your kind of top tips? Exactly. For how to... my, favorite, my favorite topic is uh, what kind of sodas do you drink or soft drinks? Because mm. I mean, that's, that's rampant, especially in the US. I don't know if you know, no. people talk of soda fountains as, as if it's some healthy fountain. Meantime, it's, <laughs> it's a tap where you can mm. drink Coke. Sugar, a sugar tap. <laughs> Whatever. Gosh, so people are still really drinking soda and, and going for that kind of heavy level of soda and sugar I've, in their I've diets. Wow. A two billion dollar hospital. It's a beautiful structure. I mean, what they built mm. is incredible. It looks mm. amazing. But, and it's sad to walk in there and see a whole bunch of Coke machines. Oof. What are they doing there? Anyway, um, so my favorite topic is I ask people about the, what, what kind of sodas do they drink. Mm -hmm. And they say, no, I don't drink those regular sodas. I drink diet sodas. I say, you know what? That's worse. <laughs> the mechanism of diet sodas being worse than regular sodas is because it alters the gut microbiome. Mm. Mm. That's why they're worse. And it is an interesting trend that I've seen in the last few years in the US. Is some, some companies now are advertising their sodas. Oh, we use pure sugar now. Mm. Because they got the message that the sweeteners are really bad. So now they're going back to using regular sugar. Sugar's the health health product. Yeah, wow. Wow. Okay. Whew, that's quite a big area to tackle and to take on. So okay, so you've said sugar and, and diet drinks are something that you tackle. What else? How else do you what do you recommend for somebody to actually alter their microbiome? You said it can be done quickly, um, and it's something that you talk to your patients about. Well, um, the, I think the three biggest areas that most people fall down on is they eat too much grains. So mm. to eat too much bread is very, very common. I've had mm. countless patients do everything right. And they said they're completely perplexed. Why are they not losing weight? They exercise. Mm. So how much bread do you eat? Oh, no, mm. I make myself a good bunch of sandwiches for lunch every day because that's what my mother mm. <laughs> I told them, I said, you know, that's probably where we're going wrong. And mm -hmm. without fail, when they cut out the bread significantly, not, a, not completely, but maybe just once, twice a week, the weight just drops off them. I've mm -hmm. had people lose, mm -hmm. average person, 40 pounds, 20 mm -hmm. plus kilograms within three months and be normal just by cutting out the bread, nothing else. So that that's a story I've mm -hmm. been told and I've, I've literally seen mm -hmm many, many times over. Mm. And lastly, so, the, mm. the, uh, you know, the cooking oils. Mm. Tell people, please only use olive oil or butter or mm. pure oil for that matter. Mm. But none of these vegetable oils. Mm. Just those three things alone um, mm. will help the vast majority of people's weight problem. So do you... So do you actually advocate that patients change their diet, do things differently as a way to come off medication or to reverse neurological diseases that they've come to you about? Is yeah. that your approach or how do you approach? What is your approach in your practice? I always tell them, um, look, it's easy to treat symptoms, mm. but it's way more important to get at the root cause of the problem. Mm. For example, uh, stroke is something I've done for many decades. Uh, I tell people, any man in the street can usually diagnose somebody has a stroke. You suddenly go weak mm. on one side or you stop speaking. Mm. And that's the easy part. But the most mm. important part is to understand what has caused the stroke. Mm. 
And invariably, it's an unhealthy cardiovascular system. And what has caused the unhealthy cardiovascular system? Poor nutrition. Mm. Because if you look at the traditional mm. societies around the world that we can study, like the Hadza and T Tanzania and the Amazonians, for example, these people do not have cancer, heart disease, um, or stroke, anything like that. In fact, the most mm. common cause of death in the heads of elderly male population is what? Falling out of trees when they search for honey. Brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> and I love that in your talk. I couldn't believe it. So I tell people these <laughs> stories and I say, if you really want to reverse this, it's very really easy. Just follow these basic guidelines. And mm. I've, I have very few people that don't do it. Mm -hmm. And all of them that do it, they come back three, six, nine, ten months later, and most of the symptoms are gone. They mm. slip, they feel better, they feel great. I've had failures, but the failures are always due to some extenuating circumstance. Mm. Uh, it mm. could be some of these military personnel have such severe post-traumatic stress disorder, traumatic brain injury, that mm. that's a separate issue that needs to be fixed. Mm. Mm. Um, so I'm not telling you about a hundred percent cure, but somewhere in the ninety percent. So what, Michael? What led you to actually take this path in your practice? Was there something that happened, or that you were exposed to initially, that kind of opened the Pandora's box for you? And when was that? Yeah, it's an interesting uh, question because we all stumble upon things. You know, Winston mm -hmm. Churchill had some clever thing about stumbling upon the truth. Mm -hmm. There's a, a clever quote mm -hmm. from about that. We, we, we do that. We, we stumble across mm. things in the path mm. of life. I think it's when I, when I was writing my first book called mm. Brain Beat. Brain Beat saying that our brains are dependent on everything in our body and the environment and even beyond that. We mm. have to keep in rhythm with nature. Otherwise, we will, we will go down the wrong path. And I realized before I write any sentence, I really must know what I'm talking about. Mm. And I had to read extensively. Mm. I read an incredible amount of other books, manuscripts. In fact, I read over a thousand manuscripts just for the one book. And I suddenly realized that there's another side to the American Heart Association guidelines that I was religiously following like a good stroke mm. neurologist. Mm. Yeah, they had to give me <laughs> guidelines. And all of a sudden, mm. I thought, well, some people are saying that there's no correlation between high cholesterol and stroke. And I was taught that there is, and I was taught to lower the cholesterol down into your boots. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, what is going on here? And I started reading more and more about it, uh, more books about it, because the journals are controlled a lot by third party uh, um, interests. Um, and then I, I realized that p people like George Mann from Vanderbilt who studied the Kenyans and found mm. absolutely no heart disease in them, even though all mm. they do is eat meat and drink milk. Mm. Mm. And there's this beautiful study about Rasmussen who studied the Eskimos and Inuit found the same thing. They just eat fat blubber mm. 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 and they throw the steak to their dogs. And they mm. also have no cancer and heart disease or dental caries. Mm. And the more you read, the more you get the right picture. And it, it's something that took quite a few years. And it's an incredible amount of reading that needs to be done. And mm. very few doctors, especially where I work, have that time mm. to do all of this. This is the thing. That's why I mm. these kind of lectures and what the Nutrition Network is doing. It's absolutely wonderful because you, mm. you, you're cutting corners to getting to the truth and saying to people, listen, this is the deal. Mm, mm. Do you want to read more about it? Sure. Here's mm. a number of references, but we've summarized it for you. Yeah, I mean, it does seem like you've had to go on a long journey, as had you know, as Tim Noakes had to. I mean, I've never met anyone who reads as and has as prolific a mind as he does. Mm. And you know, to get to that, to fast track that through those sort of 30, 40, 50 years of research is quite difficult. So, so what? So, okay, so you found it your own way by doing immense amounts of research and really through your own personal. Yeah desire to find the truth right and then you obviously changed your approach is that correct yes. Yes, or was it a slow process um not too slow because every week i have to give lectures to students and registrars mm. and residents and colleagues mm -hmm. um, 
I also um, have a monthly human evolution seminar that I run at the Ross Camp Institute. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I get the message across to people and I'm actually going to ramp those up um, with, with um, webinars and seminars now. Um, and so the message I give to students, for example, that I teach every single week, I, I tell them about this stuff mm -hmm. and I get them books to read and they mm -hmm. go and they get it. Especially my psychiatry and neurology residents, they realize, hey, there's another way to treat these illnesses, not just with drugs. And oh. so they, they, really, they really appreciate it. And the other thing that's happened, especially in neurology, we're having more and more devices, so not mm -hmm. drugs, but electric and magnetic stimulators that we put okay. on the side of the neck for treating migraine, for example, mm -hmm. treating aphasia with magnetic stimulation. And these things are very, very uh, effective. So there's a, so, there's a full revolution going on. Mm, so it is. It feels like it is the next generation of medicine is actually taking this information and, and appropriating it and using it in, in new ways. Um, yeah. But what, what are the gaps? Like what else needs to be done? What can we doing, be, be doing better at to make sure that we don't make the same mistakes? Because it feels like there's still a lack of certainly nutritional education in medicine. Um, and that uh, to a large extent, we're still working on the old model yes. of cholesterol and low fat and the guidelines are still very much in place, certainly in South Africa. Is that your experience? Oh yes, it varies from place to place. Some people, some uh, university centers in the US are way ahead of other people and mm. others are still dwelling in the past. Um, because I, I get students from all over and, and some have had very good nutritional education, but the majority have not. Just like in the rest of the world. So, so you talked about cholesterol and how you kind of opened Pandora's cholesterol box around <laughs> your research and strokes. So was it easy to change your, the way that you approached cholesterol with patients? Because I know uh, certainly a lot of the low carb doctors and practitioners tend to find that patients, if their cholesterol is elevated, are, are a bit rebellious and want to go onto statins and want to treat cholesterol as a kind of cause. How do you find things on? How do you treat, approach that? Well, uh, my experience has been that the vast majority of people hate statins, even of their own. Because most people now read stuff on the, on the web and they read about the side effects of statins and they are horrified. Okay. And, and most of them have side effects. So they say, gee, mm. that drug, and I don't want to use that drug. Mm. And I've had many mm. people that have been prescribed statins, they just stop taking it. They need to tell oh, the doctor, really? okay. I'm not using that okay. stuff, just like that. Okay, so it's not as difficult as it sounds to get people off statins and to get them to kind of see a different approach to cholesterol. You know, there's a, I, I do tell people, you know, you've got to be careful, you know, especially when, when, say, another doctor has prescribed that you can't just overrule somebody. You have to mm. discuss it with them. And that's very important. But I do tell people that there is another way. You know, mm. There's another mm. way to fight this inflammation that's actually more effective. Um, mm. And there's a tiny percentage of end-stage cardiac disease patients who will benefit from the statin purely because of its anti-inflammatory effects. Mm -hmm. When nothing else, you know, they, they're often end-stage cardiovascular patients. It's, it's very difficult to, you can't get them to exercise anymore. Mm -hmm. What are your top tips for optimizing, optimizing brain health? So brain health is, is something I've concentrated on for many years now, and I've come up with my five brain fitness rules. Okay. Um, I don't think I put them in the lecture, but they are in my books and they are very easy to remember. You know, if you don't have things in threes or fives, people won't. Mm. <laughs> I'm really pushing the envelope by having five. <laughs> the number one is actually sleep hygiene. Mm. Okay. The single most important thing that you need to adhere to is make every single night that you have optimum sleep for many reasons. Okay. The most notable one being that um, you have a tremendous amount of waste products accumulating mm -hmm. in your brain from the day's activity because our brains mm -hmm. are, are functioning at a very, very high level. Mm -hmm. And those waste products need to be cleared out during mm -hmm. hours of sleep. And it takes eight hours, by the way. Mm -hmm. Not five or six. Okay. And so 
if you don't have a good night's sleep, you simply don't function optimally the next day. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. even losing one hour of sleep on average per day leads to early dementia. Mm -hmm. That's been done in rats and in people. Anyway, that's okay, sleep. So, so sleep hygiene, but interesting you call it hygiene. Yeah. Mm. Well, uh, it may not be the best term, but mm. just having a good night's sleep. Mm. You know, the fact that we spend one third of our lives sleeping, it's got to be mm. something Mm. absolutely number two is nutrition you mm. know what you put in your body what you mm. put in your out and i i've i've got four different versions of these five brain fitness rules i have a one pager a two pager a ten pager and then i've got some books okay also by, by law, I have to also recommend other books. I can't just sit there mm -hmm. seeing patients in an institution only recommend mm -hmm. mine. Mm -hmm. I went to the attorney and said, how do I do this? I said, my solution would be I'm going to offer half a dozen books about mm -hmm. brain mm -hmm. And then people can choose whatever they want. So that's how I get around that one. But um, I have different versions and um, I have little quips about every brain rules like if you don't eat your medicine if you don't eat your food as medicine you will eat your medicine as food mm. Mm. Yeah. and uh, you cannot run away from a bad diet so so you can't just lose weight by exercising it has other um, functions such as decreasing inflammation mm. anyway, exercise is number three after okay. number two and then cognitive exercises, number four. And the fifth okay. one is socialization. Okay. Socialization. All of those will decrease inflammation in the brain and body. And all of them will lead to brain padding, in other words, increasing cognitive reserve. Mm. So, what interesting on the socialization one. So, are you talking about actually community, yeah. friends, hugs, all of that, yeah. connection, all the things that we've lost? Yeah. Uh, through the uh, through the lockdown help. phases you know having children helps having mm. parents in the house helps mm. talking to mm. people even if it's a webinar it, it helps even on the phone it, it, so all of mm. those things decrease your risk of infection cancer stroke heart attack mm. quite, quite mm. dramatically in fact so what do you think the impacts of the lockdowns and the covid separation from community has has been on mental health and I think it's of health. societies, I mean, we, we're still waiting to see how bad it's been. Mm. Uh, we suspect mm. it's had effects. Mm. But um, I just don't know how bad it's been. I haven't seen figures yet. Mm. Too I'm, early to say, I guess. I'm sure it's had major implications. So, so you've talked a lot about how diet and poor nutrition and lack of exercise and a couple of other factors are the drivers or the causes of cognitive decline. Mm -hmm. Can these things be reversed? Obviously, what we're looking at is over a 20-year period. If we started now as a perfectly healthy brain, we're not going to get all of those diseases. How do you reverse? You know, you mentioned patients that don't need to be on medication, need to change their diets. Do you actually see that in practice? Yeah, absolutely. You'd be amazed how many dementias we've reversed and cognitive okay. impairments we've reversed and behavioral impairments we've reversed. And you know, the, the other mm. thing is the drugs for dementia are, are barely effective, mm. like mm. the um, mm. The European uh, drug community, uh, I'm not sure if that's the right term, but the Europeans basically don't even bother using the for Alzheimer's. Mm. The effect is so marginal. Like, for mm. example, if, if you just exercise properly, you can decrease your risk of dementia by 50%. Mm. Now, that's a huge amount. Mm. There was a beautiful study just a year or two ago in the, one of the top journals called JAMA Neurology that if you can do 40 push-ups a day, you decrease your risk of, of a heart attack by 90%. Sure. Just that alone. Sure, that's incredible. So somebody who can do 40 push-ups, you've got to be in reasonable shape. Yes, that's quite a, I mean, that's not simple to do 40 push-ups a day. If mm. you can do 10 or 20, you're getting pretty close to the mm. same. And if you mm. look at the graphs, it does show that. So these things are very, very powerful. You know, Mediterranean mm. diet, there have been numerous studies showing that it decreases risk of cancer, stroke, heart disease by at least 30, 40%. 
Mm. Those are massive numbers. Mm. So, so, so do you get a patient onto a very strict ketogenic diet and exercising? Is that, are those your first, obviously you mentioned those five points, the other five areas, but is, do you have a very particular diet that you put them onto or does it vary? I kind of tell them a keto type of diet. You know, the, what we're calling a banting diet, a keto type of diet, a modified Atkins, these are all approximately the same kind of diet. And what I do tell people, and, and one of my favorite uh, seminars is to do, um, do a course on human evolution. A lot of it has to do with, you know, what did our ancestors eat? Maybe we should see what they were eating because our brains were much bigger and they were functioning, I think, much better mm. uh, 100 to 200,000 years ago. Mm. And what happened? What happened since then? Why have our brains decreased in size? Mm. And that's why the title of my lecture is Big Bellies, Small Brains and Descent into Going mm. Nuts. Because that's what's been happening with us because we have, we have not followed the nutritional uh, heritage that we have. Mm. And we need to get back mm. to that. But it's actually very simple. Mm. We just look at what, what traditional societies we have in the world today, like the heads of, for example, mm. what are they eating? As long as you're eating natural foods, as long as they're not super processed, as long as it's not a high carbohydrate content, it'll work. Mm. Absolutely. So um, it's a traditional diet, and the ancestral mm. diet. I called it the ancestral diet in one of my books. Mm. I don't mm. know if it's going to take off, but it may do. Mm. Amazing. So anything else that you would like to mention about the work that you do and that you, we haven't covered in your talk? That you'd like to bring in? Well, the, the brain fitness rules are something that um, I think are working well. I, I distribute them to most of my patients and my colleagues do as well. Mm. We follow that. It needs to be buttressed by, by frequent update talks or frequent follow-ups in the clinic, even though mm. it's twice a year. Mm. It's be re-emphasized. And something that I think is really very, very important is coaching, medical coaching. Okay. You know, just like everybody, no matter how dedicated a sportsman you are, a lot of people have a fitness trainer. Mm. So what I now provide is brain fitness trainer. People like so Is that with the medical professional or is that with a coach? Well, it can be either. Mm. I mean, I do it for my patients in the clinic. But can mm. something else do it? Sure. You know, mm -hmm. if, if you're a nurse, for example, you could follow the, the protocol and guide patients through it. You don't even have to be somebody medical. You could mm -hmm. just be somebody who has a specific interest and just coach that person. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you why this really is important and why it does work extremely well, because there was a stroke study called the Sampras trial. Okay. Mm -hmm. It was highly regarded and everybody knew what the outcome was going to be. It was basically blockage in the brain arteries, not in the carotid, but up here. Mm. And we, we were able to relieve the blockage with a stent. So we put a balloon mm. in there and we open up that artery. And then we put a little metal stent in there to keep it open. Mm. And people said, this is great. Now we can treat this called intracranial stenosis, mm. blockage of the intracranial arteries. Mm -hmm. with Balloons and stents. Mm. You know, but. they asked them what the complete opposite. So okay. the control group had best medical therapy. All right. Okay. And they had three times the success rate of the interventional or surgical group. Wow. Okay. And why? And the major factor was because those people that were in the medical group, they actually employed a, a company to coach them. So these were oh. high-level um, professional coaches that saw these people, I don't know how often, maybe many times a week, mm -hmm. made sure that they stuck to their, their brain fitness rules, if you like, and they did three times better than this fancy intervention that we figured out. Wow. So, that so it was three times more effective. Coaching was three times more effective than an actual intracranial stent. In this particular uh, study. And this was a very, very... That's incredible. Study. Yeah, look it up, the SAMPRIS mm. trial, S-A-M-P-R-I-S. So you're saying that behavior, intention, and mindset is, is more potentially more effective than surgical intervention? Well, 
or is that a bit too no, far of an assumption? A disease process, but I think mm. I think the same will happen across the board in most illnesses. Mm. Um, for example, mm. if you have diabetes and you have heart disease and stroke tendencies, if you coach somebody into being having a fit body with a normal body mass index, mm. I think you'll achieve mm. the same dramatic results as opposed to just giving them medications. Mm. Absolutely, sure. And this sure. is a study that has actually done reported results are known mm. and very, very critically evaluated. And people said, hey, you know, this the control group with coaching did three times better. There you go. Incredible. Important. Incredible. Wow. Thank you for that. Thank you so much, Michael. So much to think about. And I've made a note of some of your very, very interesting brain fitness points. And I'm definitely going to read a few more of your books now after this talk. I'm fascinated. You're absolutely amazing. Thank you.